Hello and welcome to Star Victoria's ABCs of Inclusive Education. My name's Denise Boyd and I'm the Executive Officer of Star Victoria. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on and their elders past, present and emerging. In this session, you'll be hearing from Charles Kemp from the Department of Education and Training Victoria, Cynthia Pilly, a long-term member of STAR and a current committee member, and Carolyn Vimpani, STAR's Vice President. STAR Victoria was established to provide advocacy with and for people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Since 1970, we've stood beside people with intellectual disability to speak up for their rights and remove barriers that stop them living the lives that they want to live. We can help with telephone advice, face-to-face -face help, referral and support as well as direct advocacy alongside you and of course our campaign work to advocate for changes to the laws, policies and practices that we identify as barriers. During this session we'll share information, suggestions and videos to help you understand your rights and options for your child's education or to help you as a teacher in the classroom. We also have additional resources on our website for you to access in your own time. I'd now like to introduce Charles Kemp Charles is a Regional Disability Coordinator for South Western Victoria. Charles is here to talk about awareness of the Victorian Government's Inclusive Education Policy. Welcome Charles. Hello and welcome to this online webinar session. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with an overview of the Victorian Department of Education policies and practices that may be relevant to your thinking and decision making when choosing an appropriate educational pathway for your child in 2021. This presentation is particularly focused on supporting parents' awareness of the options available to you when preparing to enrol students with special educational needs. From an enrolment perspective in Victoria, it's important to recognise that under the Education and Training Reform Act, Schooling is compulsory for all students aged between six and 17 years, unless an exemption has been granted. This applies to all schools, including mainstream, specialist and government English language schools or centres. Every Victorian student has a legislated right to attend their designated neighbourhood school and may be enrolled in another school subject to sufficient accommodation. So how to choose a school and how to enrol? Well, the first step is really to ask yourself these questions. How far do you want to travel? And is the school reasonably close to home or work? How will the school be able to cater for your child's needs and interests? What facilities do they offer? And are you comfortable with the feel of the school? How will the teachers and the school curriculum support your child's development? including social, emotional, physical and cognitive needs? Does the school's policy of, of homework and discipline reflect your own values and expectations? And how does the school work in partnership with families? If your child has a disability, you may need to also ask, do you live in an area where you can get supported transport to school? Step two is to search for a school. So to find your neighbourhood school, go to the Find My School Victoria website, as shown on the screen, and type in your home address. The map on the screen shows all Victorian primary schools and outlines their designated neighbourhood zones. The map is interactive and will take you to your neighbourhood school if you enter your home address. Some students may be eligible to attend a specialist school. The Find My School website also has a tab to help you find local specialist schools that are in your area. If you click on the school, it will provide you with information about the particular specialisation and entry requirements for that school. Specialisations may include specialised support for students with an intellectual disability, support for students on the autism spectrum, or for students with hearing and vision impairments. It's also important to be aware that all school specialisations are not available in every local area. Visiting schools is the best way to determine the answer to all of your questions. Remember, 
every Victorian student has a legislated right to enrol in their designated neighbourhood school and may be enrolled in another school subject to sufficient accommodation, you will need to talk with your chosen schools to understand the actual options you have. Once you've made your decision about enrolment, know when you need to enrol. Well, you can find this out by talking with your chosen school. Then submit your enrolment forms. If a school decides not to accept your enrolment, you can appeal. This situation can happen if you request to enrol in a school that's outside of your designated neighbourhood school zone and the school does not have enough spare places. The parent information section on the Department of Education website explains exactly what you should do if you wish to appeal. Education for All is a school policy that gives schools a clear definition of inclusive education and what the legal obligations are for supporting students with disabilities. Inclusive education means that all members of every school community are valued and supported to fully participate, learn, develop, succeed within an inclusive school culture. Education for All acknowledges that some children and young people have intersecting identities or additional needs that schools may need to take into consideration. Internationally, Australia is a signatory to a range of United Nations conventions. In 2008, Australia signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Right for Persons with Disabilities. And in particular, Article 24 of this convention recognises and outlines the rights of persons with a disability to education. In Victoria, this is expressed using the term education for all. Education for all is a school policy that gives all schools a clear definition of inclusive education and what the legal obligations are for supporting students with disabilities. In Victoria, our inclusive education system enables all students to be welcomed, accepted and engaged so that they can participate, achieve and thrive in school life. Inclusive education ensures that students with disabilities are not discriminated against and are accommodated to participate in education on the same basis as their peers. It acknowledges and responds the diverse needs, identities and strengths of all students. And it occurs when students with disabilities and, and additional needs are treated with respect and are involved in the decision making about their education. It benefits students of all abilities in the classroom and fosters positive cultural change in attitudes and beliefs about disability, both in and beyond the school environment. Inclusive education contributes to positive learning, engagement and well-being for all students. From a legal perspective, the rights of persons with disabilities are supported by a range of Victorian legislative requirements that apply to schools. Schools must meet their obligations under the Equal Opportunity Act, the Disability Discrimination Act, and also the Disability Standards for Education, which require schools to make reasonable adjustments to accommodate students with a disability. The Victorian SHARE principles provide guidance for all members of the school community on the main features of inclusive education. S, meaning student-centred. H, standing for human rights focused. A, for acknowledging strengths. R, for respecting legal obligations. And E, ensuring that this work is evidence-based. All schools as education providers must comply with the Equal Opportunity Act, the Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards for Education. The Disability Standards for Education cover enrolment, participation, curriculum development, student support services and the elimination of harassment and victimisation and provides guidance to schools on the rights of students with disabilities, the legal obligations on education providers and guidance on some of the measures that would help them to demonstrate this compliance. The standards apply to all students with disabilities, not just those who are el eligible for support under targeted funding programs. 
Under both state and Commonwealth laws, schools must make reasonable adjustments to accommodate students with disabilities or additional needs. An adjustment is a measure or action taken to assist all students to participate in education and training on the same basis as their peers without a disability. To make your, sure your child has the same learning opportunities as, a, as children without disability, an education provider must make reasonable adjustments. Reasonable adjustments may include changes to the way your child is supported in their learning, the kindergarten or school environment and providing additional supports. Education providers can make reasonable adjustments in the classroom, in the playground, to excursions or camps, or making adjustments to the premises. Examples of adjustments can be seen in these images. They may include ensuring access to specialised professional development or training for your child's teachers and other staff, changing activities or work in line with your child's needs, providing different ways to access information. For example, adaptive or assistive technology, sign language, multimedia, braille or illustrated text. Using assistive technologies like voice recognition software, screen readers and adjustable desks, changing class schedules or locations, accessing school support services like psychologists, speech therapists and visiting teachers, changing the premises, for example, installing a ramp or a lift, offering different assessment options, for example, oral assessments instead of written assessments, or multiple choice questions instead of long answer questions. Providing extra time to finish classwork or projects is another reasonable adjustment. Or modifying activities and excursions. For example, if your child cannot take part in an activity due to their disability, the education provider can offer an alternative. To help an education provider determine if an adjustment is reasonable, they have, have, may have regard to a number of factors, including considering your child's disability, how your child's disability affects their ability to take part in education, talking to you and your child about the type of assistance that they need, or reviewing any relevant reports from your child's allied health or medical practitioners about their specific individual needs and the support that can help them consider if the adjustment will allow your child to achieve their learning outcomes, take part in programs and increase their independence. It's important to consider how the adjustment might affect the education provider, their staff and other children or students, the cost and benefit of making the adjustment. If an adjustment is not considered reasonable, the education provider does not have to make the adjustment. There are four reasons why this may be the case. If the adjustment might harm other students, if the adjustment might harm staff, if the adjustment may stop others from doing their best, or if the adjustment might create financial hardship on the school. This doesn't mean that the school won't make other reasonable adjustments. It just means some specific adjustments suggested or requested may not be considered reasonable in the eyes of the school. It is, however, reasonable to expect a school would let you know if they feel a proposed adjustment is unreasonable. You can speak to your child's education provider about adjustments at any time during your child's education. Schools should work with you to develop a student support group. Sometimes, they may call this the team around the learner. Some things that will help. Share appropriate medical information with your school. Keep the school updated. View the relationship as a partnership and recognise that your relationship with the school is important. Where appropriate, they will use this information to work with you to develop an individual education plan for your child. You can complain or raise a concern if you're unhappy with the support your child is getting. If this is the case, you should talk to your education provider first. If that doesn't assist, engage with your regional disabilities coordinator. 
and if necessary, develop a relationship with student support services. If you're unhappy with how your concern was handled, you're encouraged to use our complaints process. Department staff will refer you to the complaints process if you ask them. However, if you need to, the complaints process can also be accessed through the Victorian Department of Education website. There are many parent supports available to help you. Most importantly, please do not be afraid to ask for help, advice or support. To find Department of Education supports, we encourage you to use the parent pages of the official Victorian Department of Education website. Remember the supports are there to help you if you need it. Understand there'll be some information about specific supports available in different areas of the state later in this presentation. Remember, schools are funded to meet the needs of all students. The standard funding processes include what's known as a student resource package, equity funding and a range of other funding sources for schools. The program for disability, students with disabilities, however, provides targeted supplementary resources to assist schools to meet their obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act. These resources do not define or limit the support provided by a school for a student with a disability. Schools are required to consider all resources available to them when planning for all students in their care, including students with a disability. A school's requirement to make reasonable adjustments is not dependent or conditional upon the availability of resources under the Program for Students with Disabilities. The Program for Students with Disabilities has seven categories for funding support with clear criteria. It's important to be aware that only Victorian government, government schools are able to apply for funding through the Program for Students with Disabilities. You're encouraged to talk with your school about your child and to work with them to determine if your child is eligible. Whilst a student may or may not be eligible for supplementary funding through the program for students with disabilities, medical information can often be helpful in assisting, assisting educators with their educational planning for your child. Give some thought to what you are prepared and what you are not prepared to share with your school. It's important to remember that there are many avenues available to support your child's development. I've used an example of sport here. However, it has shown simply to encourage you to think about your child's needs and to seek opportunities to develop their personal capacity. While school is a particularly important factor in the development of your child, it is only one. There are many more if you have the desire and the time to seek them out. If you'd like further information about any of the issues discussed today, the department website provides contact details for a range of specific divisions and department areas. If you'd like support with anything relating to students with an additional educational need, please feel free to call the number on your screen and ask for the Regional Disability Coordinator in your area. They'll be more than pleased to assist you. Thanks, Charles, for that really informative presentation. We know there's a lot of information there, but don't worry, all the links that you need will be on our website for you to access in your own time. I'd now like to introduce Carolyn Vimpani. Carolyn is an educator with decades of experience and will present some common scenarios the parents of children with intellectual disability may encounter as they begin their child's education journey or when transitioning from primary to secondary school. Welcome, Carolyn. Thanks to Denise for that introduction. Firstly, I'd like to share a little of Star's experience over many years of advocating for inclusive education. There is plenty of evidence that shows there are real and viable alternatives for students other than specialist or special schools. Parents sometimes feel they don't have options or are steered to special schools as the only option for their child. And we know they can be made to feel guilty as though choosing a mainstream school isn't the best thing for their child. 
we'll have a deeper look at this and see what's possible. First, let's have a look at this short video, which is an excellent summary of some of the various interpretations of inclusion. I don't understand why I'm at the back of the class. I wish I was like everyone else. I want to do what they are doing. But here I am, doing the same old number activity, watching as my classmates learn something else. Don't they know that they're setting me up to fail? Don't they know they hold my future in their hands? I want to work with my class, learn what they are learning, and do the activities they do. But here I am, stuck at the back, limited by low expectations. Having a one-on-one -on -one teacher aid just teaches me to rely on them and means I get less attention from the teacher. I am not included in the classroom. I am in the same room but segregated from my peers, sat to the side or back, working on different things and missing out. I want to be free to learn with my peers, reach my full potential and be seen to be like everyone else. I need something to change. You may be wondering what was wrong with this picture. I am in the classroom with my peers, sitting in my seat, learning the same things as everyone else. You may think this is inclusion, but it's not. I am stifled, limited, and held back from reaching my full potential. Though I love my teacher aid, I don't get to think for myself. In fact, a lot of the time, my teacher aid does it for me, even whispering the answer in my ear when I already know it. The more she is with me, the more I realise that there is no point in me thinking for myself because she will give me the answer anyway. I'm sure there are other kids who also need her help. Does she need to be with me? Can't she help others? Surely if I need help, I can put my hand up and ask my teacher like my friends do. My friends and classmates want to help me, but by having someone right next to me, they can't. I need to learn from my peers, be able to do group work and be challenged. I want to be allowed to fail or succeed and learn from it. I need something to change. Can you find me in the crowd? Inclusion is more than just a word. It is a culture, a mindset, and an expectation that everyone can and will learn and succeed along their age-appropriate peers. I know it can be challenging to include me in the learning as sometimes I might require extra resources and information, but giving me space to learn from my teacher and peers is the best way to challenge me and allow me to grow. I want to learn the same things as my classmates, and I want teachers to have the same expectations of me as my friends. My learning may need to be modified, but I still want the opportunity to show what I can do, not focus on what I can't. Treat me the same as any other student and watch me flourish. I will rise to the challenge of expectations you set for me. Are you ready to really include me? Let's have a look at some of the scenarios a parent might experience when making a decision about where their child will go to school. Here's a scenario that's not uncommon. Our second child, James, is starting school next year. He has been diagnosed with being on the spectrum and has an intellectual disability. I'm worried that he'll not cope with the demands of being in prep and I'd hate him to play up if he's unhappy. I worry that his brother will be upset for him too. What if he's teased and bullied? Let's run through the key things we recommend to parents who are facing this type of situation. 
always remember that your child has the right to participate in all education courses and programs on the same basis as their peers. Discuss your child's transition with preschool, kindergarten or secondary school staff. This is the first step. At this stage, you may need to think about reports and information relevant to your child's learning and interaction. Identifying what your child is good at, likes doing and potentially needs help with. The funding available for specialist equipment or supports. Contact your local school and consult with the principal and staff. This is your opportunity to discuss the school's inclusive education practices, how they'll cater for your child, facilities and curriculum support, and partnerships with the family. Review school policies and practices. For example, ask for bullying policies for the school and how they address it. The school then establishes a support group which can include specialists you agree to be included, preschool teachers and aides, parents and significant others. For example, an independent advocate. This will be more fully discussed later. The support group then jointly creates the support plan. Here's another scenario. Parent quite naturally wants to know how their child will be supported in the classroom. How will I know what learning support my daughter Jenny will get at school? She's old enough for prep but sometimes needs reminding about what to do next. It doesn't seem to matter at preschool but prep is another thing altogether. Here's what we'd recommend. Discuss your child's needs with the teacher and support staff. Make an appointment to do this with the teacher or ask for a meeting of the support group. The support group will create a learning plan. It's important to review progress regularly. Identify adjustments your child might need. There are a range of adjustments that can be made in the classroom, in the playground, on camps and excursions. Examples of adjustments might include support of speech pathologists, psychologists and occupational therapists or physiotherapists, extra time allocated for learning and assessment, additional training for teachers, technology to support learning, assistance and teacher aids, customising course information to be made accessible, for example, Braille teaching tools and practices, taking into account learning styles and preferences. What if your child has a communications device like a microphone for the teacher to help with hearing issues or an iPad for a non-verbal child? How confident would you be that it would be effectively used in the classroom? Let's consider Julia's case. We have an NDIS plan and Julia, our daughter, is now using a communication device. It's made a big difference, but it took us a lot of time and frustration to get her to where she is now. I don't think the teacher will know how to assist her to use it in the classroom. Can I ask the principal to place Julia with a more experienced teacher? Some teachers are inexperienced in the use of such devices, so how might we tackle this? Here's a summary of the things we recommend. Request regular support group meetings with the principal and teacher in attendance. Do your research on the communication device, research how it's used in education settings, access reports from specialists on how to use this to support student learning. Consider engaging a communication specialist to inform support group discussions and help the teacher in the classroom. Develop a support plan with the school to assist Julia in using her communication device to support her learning. 
and above all, challenge discrimination. Forbidding the use of communication devices could be seen as discriminatory practice. What if your child has some toileting issues that could lead to him being bullied or teased? How would you tackle them? Consider this scenario. Robert's mum wants all three of her children to go to the same school. However, she doesn't think Robert will be out of nappies by next year. She's hoping to go back to work, but if her son needs her for changing, she won't be able to get regular employment. She's also worried about putting his needs onto the prep teacher or having a situation that takes attention from other children. She hasn't seen a change table anywhere at the school, so naturally she wants to know how his dignity would be protected and his care managed. Here's some suggestions based on our experience. I should note that it's only not children with disabilities who might have toileting issues. They can lead to problems at school. Here's how to manage this. Work closely with the school to develop and maintain a health support plan. Develop a strong relationship and talk regularly and ask questions such as, where can Robert be changed? Where can a bag of clean, dry clothes be kept on site in case of nappy leakages or other toileting accidents? Who is responsible for assisting Robert? What are the procedures for nappy disposal? Make sure you prepare for this meeting. Do some research beforehand so you can make suggestions and offer solutions. Write down a list of questions you may want to ask. Invite a support person or advocate such as Star Victoria or Parent Victoria to assist in the conversation. Identify solutions with the teacher and support staff on addressing personal needs, ensuring Robert's dignity is maintained. Advocate for the inclusion of an accessible toilet, change table, hoist as a reasonable adjustment. Help the school with extra applications for support if required and raise a concern if you're unhappy with the outcome. We've explored some scenarios and sh shared some solutions and tips. But what does it look like in practice? Let's explore the student support group we discussed earlier which is a practical example of a collaborative model. This involves a group discussion with the needs of the student at the centre. Everyone participates with the aim of finding the best outcomes. The student is always at the centre. Although there may be times where it's not practical to have them present in person. However, it's good practice to always ask the question any of any decision to admit them, check yourself for hidden bias. The group should include parents, teachers, the principal or their representative, and if possible, the student. It can also include a parent advocate, support staff, and those with specialist expertise co-opted to act as consultants to the group. It's really important to have regular meetings and that everyone has the opportunity to be heard. The members need to understand the process and how to resolve differences so decisions can be made. The group needs to build trust with each other and keep the student at the centre of every discussion. Meeting records are kept and shared. Meetings are scheduled when everyone can participate. This is particularly important when parents work. The group can be convened at the request of any member. At STAR, we say that people most affected by a particular decision have the right to participate in that decision. The support group is proactively formed to ensure a student with additional needs is supported to make good progress and be fully included. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. To summarise, there are four key stages of the collaborative process. Shared information, 
shared decision making, shared action and shared responsibility. In STARS experience, this is a robust process that provides for procedural safeguards, parent participation, parent advocacy and the right to review and full participation by classroom teachers. It is firmly underpinned by the inclusive education policies and practices of the Department of Education and Training, as we heard about in the previous section. Thanks for your attention. I'll now, I'll now hand you back to Denise. Thanks, Carolyn. Lots of great suggestions and advice there. We hope this has helped you with some issues that you might be experiencing. Many of the issues that arise are not uncommon when you and your child are at that transition point, and there are practical ways to tackle them. It's now time to hear from Cynthia Pilly. Cynthia will share her own story as a parent of a child who has a disability and their journey through childhood to his independent adulthood. Connections are so important. You aren't alone and there is help and advice available. So let's hear from Cynthia. Welcome, Cynthia. Thanks, Denise. I've called this presentation that I will share with you, Inclusive Education, a survival guide for parents as I will take you through my personal journey and learnings from this experience. Inclusive education is about connection, connection to others, connection to society, and connection to learning. And as I present, I'd like you to consider these three comments. The first one, we all belong where everyone belongs. The second, it is not only your right to an inclusive education for your child, it is your duty. And the third is a quote from Marsha Forrest, and the emperor is naked, which had an impact on me as I realised I needed to be part of the solution. Children with handicaps will not be welcomed into our schools because we wish it to happen, but only if we make it happen. So this rang true for me when we took the plunge and requested Carl, our eldest child, move from the special school that he had attended for some five years to the nearest secondary school. We realised that parents have to skill themselves to bring about school inclusion and to get the best possible education for their children. It takes work, but the rewards are immense and lifelong. Carl now lives independently. He has done for 20 plus years, works in open employment, has a home loan, and has a lifestyle similar to his brother and sisters. I have no doubt that had the state government in the 80s not reviewed special education resulting in the development of guidelines and procedures, to support students transitioning to the regular school, Carl would have always required substantial living supports and aspects of his segregated education continued across his life and our peace of mind. In the time available, I'll attempt to drill down to the nitty gritty and share our journey in the context of questions often asked by ourselves and by schools and build on some of the problems and solutions already referred to earlier in this forum. One common question I hear is, won't my child need one-to-one -one aid support all the time? This is often a deep-seated perception and can be put as the kind of condition, sometimes a threat. He can come here if we are funded for a full-time aid, but not if, but if not, his time in school will have to correspond with the allocation. Such comments are out of step with education department policy. Most importantly, very, very rarely is this necessary, and even more rarely for longer than a few weeks or months until the school and classes are in full swing. In special schools, there is not one-to-one -one staffing. Importantly, families do not and can't provide one-to-one -one support, yet home is usually their most inclusive and successful environment. Frequent student support group meetings to plan and review is the key. In the class of 22, rather than the class of 21, plus one student has a disability as a model. The aid is a resource to the teacher, 
so that all 2020 students are engaged in learning. That can mean that the aid can practice planned neglect and be used one-to-one -one as well as in class group work with or without a nominated student. I wasn't totally upfront with Carl's behavioural issues as I feared it would frighten off the school. However, many of his concerning behaviours just disappeared, so I needn't have worried. Such was the impact of being with and copying his non-disabled peers. Carl was progressing so well out of my wildest dreams that in his second year full time, we figured that the small allocated aid time would assist him stay on task, but in fact the reverse happened. Teachers unconsciously saw him as not their responsibility. So Carl unconsciously took less notice of the teacher and other students unconsciously saw him as an add-on to the class. The take home message is to use aid time, aid support, very sparingly and always look to reduce one-on-one -on -one aid time as much as possible. Parents Victoria printed an article in their 1990 March edition of their magazine, Victorian Parent, titled The Integration Aid Recommended Dose Use Only as Necessary. Another comment I hear often is, but surely the gap widens and these children will not be able to go on at regular school to secondary education. The gap is a common cat's cry. The bigger the gap, the greater they need to be with one's peers. A quote that says it all from Massachusetts Advocacy Centre in 1987. My child can talk and there's one reason why he can. It's because of the other children. The typical children kept coming up to him and demanding that he talk. They knew how to get an answer from him and they wouldn't let him get away with a single syllable response. Now I ask you, what teacher or teachers could do that for my son, much less for a whole class of kids with autism? That's just not realistic. Now this was very much Carl's experience. When Carl first attended school as a 12 year old, he wouldn't make eye contact. If he couldn't follow the conversation, he started discussing his guinea pigs and he couldn't tell you how many fingers on a hand, but he could probably count it out. There was no canteen at the special school, but he wanted to use the canteen at secondary school and he managed to work out if you took $5, you can pretty much get what you wanted. If you're going to get on, you need to know the rules. The other thing too was things like sporting activities, football. Even if you're not playing, if you want to make sense of stuff, it's good if you know the rules. And he, for the first time, actually understood some of that stuff. But possibly the most glaring issue confronting us about his segregated education was that Carl's sexuality was kicking in, as was the case for his adolescent and a little older female and male classmates. An incident was reported to us that occurred between Carl and other students that totally freaked me out. It was a moment of clarity. And as Carl experienced his changing from boy to man in the adolescent mainstream, how on earth would he know what was appropriate? What you can say and what you can't say or do. This is where spirit, special education provision, seriously fails our young people. I dread to think what lays ahead for many in matters of forming healthy and full, fulfilling relationships when you haven't even experienced your adolescent years in the mainstream, as do most Victorian students who don't have a disability. Let's consider another myth. What about the fact there is only one teacher for 25 to 30 plus students in a regular school? Wouldn't students with disability be better off in smaller specialist classes with more teacher support? Research has found that segregating students, even in classes with low student-teacher ratios, has not brought about greater success for students with disability. Think about it, it makes no sense. If it takes you longer to learn things, how is it going to enhance one's learning to be with others who also can't to talk, sorry, <laughs> and learn more slowly? Schools are microcosms of society from which we all learn. Bob Jackson, PhD, adjunct associate professor of education at Cowan University wrote, 
I could not find one research article comparing inclusion with segregation that favours segregation. Professors and heads of education at Australian universities were written to asking if they knew of any contrary finding, nothing. Similarly, directors, general of education in all Australian states were asked for the research base on which they recommended segregated schooling. While many referred to government reports, they also could not provide empirical evidence in support of segregated schooling for children with an intellectual disability. That is, the belief commonly stated to parents that children with a disability are better off in segregated education is unsupported by research. Bear in mind that while one has the right to regular school, it may be many more years before the child who has a disability is welcomed, like his or her brother and sisters. Social change can take more than a generation, regardless of it being the right thing to do. But how can children who can't speak or who have high support needs or behavioural difficulties fit in at regular school? Students with very high support needs now attend regular schools. The nature and degree of their disabilities means that substantial additional supports will have been provided to make this possible. Students already in regular school include those with autism, with major medical needs or multiple disability. Some have very significant intellectual disability and some require full-time attending care. There is absolutely nothing that can be provided in a special school that can't be provided in the regular school. The late Ethel Tembe, who travelled to five countries on a Churchill Fellowship, wrote a letter to Julia Gillard in June 2008, which in summary said, learnings from Nebraska, where most schools are fully integrated, shows when there is full integration, families are better supported, children are better supported and thriving from differences in the norm. Next comes the question, don't these children really need living skills and survival skills rather than academic learning? Any of us will survive far better in adulthood when we have been exposed to, if not gained broader reading, writing, maths, communication and social interaction skills. Carl at 12 years had very little in the way of basic reading, writing and math skills. I assumed that it may not be possible for him to progress much further. In a very short time, instead of him being unable to learn, it became clear that it was because much of the curriculum students access in the mainstream isn't offered in special or segregated education. I discovered, discovered that he was progressing rapidly. His general knowledge and capacity for recall in the subject areas of math and science, which I didn't think were within his grasp, were being learned. While originally he was going to mainstream school to do good with your hand subjects, he ended up in science and came home enthusiastic with gems such as, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Other skill learns in math set him up to be able to use a calculator. He's still not great with numbers, but manages his money adequately. The final barrier people or families put up, won't my child be subjected to bullying or teasing in a regular school? Unfortunately, to varying degrees, most students experience teasing and sometimes bullying. An important strategy is for teachers to always model appropriate ways to treat students with disability. If their approach is positive, fair, inclusive and equal, then other students will pick up on how to also interact appropriately. Six months into year seven, I received a phone call from a student welfare officer who was very supportive of Carl. His teachers believed they were not teaching him anything and they wanted to set up a meeting to discuss his returning to the special school. She was concerned that she had seen Carl alone and was fearful of the impact on him. She also was concerned that he was hanging around her office until most students had gone home. I actually thought that wasn't a bad strategy as we had particularly impressed on him that he must not hit other students. But not teaching him anything? How could they think that they were not teaching him anything? I realised that it was probably because they had never met, much less taught a child with such low competencies. I filled a large page of notes on all the things the school had taught him. They had no idea of the positive impact and the thought of Carl leaving was never entertained again.
In closing, beware of part-time inclusion. Beware of attempts to match skills with age level, special classes and units for students with special needs. All students have special needs. And beware of islands in the mainstream. It never works and only serves to undermine, delay what full inclusion can achieve for all students with and without a disability. Carl started out as a visitor in classes and we had always said that if it didn't work out, he could always go back to special school. But we had never regretted our decision. In fact, the very thought that this would not have occurred is unthinkable. As I said at the start, he now has a life similar to other members of the Victorian community. It is a step you too will never, never regret. I'd now like to hand back to Denise. Thanks, Cynthia. A really personal story and one of resilience and determination to ensure that Carl was able to acquire the skills that he needed to live his own life. We've come to the end of this presentation and thanks for watching. Remember, STAR is here to help you with advice and information. Our contact details are on screen now, so please do head on over to our website for more information and get in touch if you need additional advice. Thanks again and good luck with your ABC's journey.